Well, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this week's episode of the Bedford Bible Church podcast. Uh, we are about a month behind in getting these recorded and posted. So the review of the sermons I'm going to be doing today looks back to the 23rd of August. And so uh, we're going to, as usual, take about 10 minutes to review the morning message and then 10 minutes to review the evening message. And I'll try and get these kind of cranked out a little bit more regularly and catch up with uh, where we are. So uh, bear with me. Hopefully we'll get this done in the near future. So in the Sunday mornings, continuing to go through the life of Elisha. And we've had several uh, messages, I think it's about five, six messages, just introducing Elisha's life. And we're taking quite a while to get to the place where we are now to really look at the life of Elisha himself. And so we've gone through the introduction to who he was. We've looked at that transition from Elijah to Elisha. And now we are looking at Elisha himself. And the passage of scripture we'll be in for this is 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Kind of a short passage, so I'm going to go ahead and read that. It says, And the men of the city said uh, unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, for the water is naught and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters, there shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed according to this day, or unto this day, according to the same of which uh, Elisha spake. Now, everything was seen about Elisha's life, and the more I study his life, the more I see that there is grace. There's the goodness of God that's there to those who are undeserving, and it's not just sufficient, there's an abundance, there's more than is needed. And so we're going to see that in the miracle before us uh, this morning or today. Now, um, of this portion of scripture, Spurgeon had this to say, We must not fight God's battles with weapons of ill will. For us to hate those who are in error and talk of them with contempt or wish them ill or do them wrong is not according to the spirit of Christ. You cannot cast out Satan by Satan, nor correct error by violence, nor overcome hate by hate. The conquering weapon of the Christian is love. Now, the grace of God brings healing, and that's something that we'll see in the miracle before us. So the first thing then is there is a city that almost had it all in verse 19. You know, think of the power of almost. How often is almost close, but not enough? When we look at this city here, it was almost a perfect city. They said the situation of the city is pleasant. Uh, now, Elisha is still a Jericho. When Elijah first disappeared, they ignored Elisha and the sons of the prophets went to search for him. And, you know, these skeptics arrived just as Elisha had experienced a huge victory at Jordan. We need to be prepared for the enemy to attack after victories have been won. Uh, one commentator, John Butler, said, if, can, if Satan cannot stop the blessing, he will next try to rob you of its enjoyment. And that's kind of what happened with Elisha. Now, the sons of the prophets returned, obviously unsuccessful. They couldn't find the body of Elisha of Elijah because he'd been taken up to God. They had a low view of God. They thought maybe God had abandoned Elijah's body to the desert. You know, maybe they weren't quite ready to accept Elisha. Maybe they wanted to make sure Elijah's body hadn't fallen to earth and required burial. But whatever the case may be, we see Elisha shows them grace. Um, you know, in this non-essential area, he doesn't force his authority. He allows grace. And his wisdom proved itself. Um, you know, Elisha was showing them, uh, and Matthew Henry put it this way, traversing hills and valleys will never bring us to Elijah, but the imitation of his holy faith and zeal will in due time. You see, these uh, sons of the prophets, they wanted to try and find Elijah. They weren't willing to let him go, but they could never find him. He was gone. But they could, by imitating his faith and zeal, uh, find him in a different way. So Elisha shows grace to the sons of the prophets. He's still here at Jericho. And as I said, it's a pleasant city. They said to him, look, look, this is a pleasant city. This was an oasis in the Jordan Valley. You had a few miles north of Dead Sea. Uh, and, and this valley itself uh, had a river that began at a nearby uh, spring. And, you know, the rivers and springs in the area, it made the valley a favorite place for many throughout the generations, not just in Elisha's time, but uh, afterwards and even down to the time of Christ. I think the Herods had a palace that was there. Now, 
Remember that Jericho had been built in defiance of God, and yet it had not been abandoned by God. In Joshua 6.26, Joshua pronounced a curse on the city and said that whoever rebuilt it would build it in and then lose two of their sons. And in 1 Kings 16.34, the man who rebuilt the city did so and two of his sons died in the process. You know, wickedness in national leadership not only causes sin in themselves, but sinners are encouraged to sin. In the days of Ahab, Jericho was rebuilt at great cost. But you know, Jericho, although it had abandoned God, it had not been abandoned by God. Elisha is sent here to minister to them. And you know, generations later, Jesus would go there and minister. And what a demonstration of grace. If ever there was a place that could be abandoned by God, it would be the likes of Jericho. And yet even there, there is help offered. Now, it's a pleasant city. Everything appeared to be good, uh, but only appeared to be that way because it was lacking something. Clean water. It says it was not bad, worthless. When it says it's barren, uh, you know, the, the women, it's thought, were losing their children. They were having miscarriages. The animals weren't having young. The crops weren't growing. It literally means evil. You know, it looked pleasant. But you know what? For all that, they didn't have the most essentials in life. Satan has a way of making things appear pleasant. Jericho appeared pleasant. Sin often appears pleasant, but it is always deadly. Sin may seem like it's going to give pleasure, but it never lasts. Uh, there's also a reminder here of how fragile our lives are. So you have a city that almost had it all, and then you're going to see the solution in verses 20 and 21. Uh, and we see a phrase here that I use often at mealtimes, pass the salt. You know, these uh, people of Jericho, they showed wisdom and turned into Elisha for help. And, you know, miracles in Elisha's life and throughout the Bible are usually redemptive. They restore something. They right a wrong. They're prophetic in a sense in that they point to the restoration in creation. Now, Elisha here takes the, the new bowl he's requested. It's filled with salt and it's poured into the water. Maybe it was a test of their faith. You know, a simple step of obedience here led to the water being restored. Obedience, even in something small and seeming inconsequential, uh, can bring great results. You know, the new bowl here, it was something clean and fresh. And so it is when God works through Christians that he makes of us new creatures before he can turn us into channels of blessing to others. And then as soon as the salt is poured into that uh, fountain, into that spring, it's healed. You know, a little salt and water can help replenish uh, an individual's electrolytes after you've gone for a run or exercise. But, you know, usually salt and water ruins it. And, you know, even... If it had some natural healing ability about it, such a small amount in a natural spring would do nothing of any consequence. You know, the salt was symbolical. The salt was an object lesson. It was God who healed the waters. And having healed the source, everything that flowed from it was good. From the root comes the fruit. If we are to produce righteousness, we must have a righteous root. James 3 talks of the, uh, the, the impossibility or it's wrong for good to come from evil, or from evil to come from good. A righteous fruit demands a righteous root, and in us, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. This miracle, as many do, as I've already mentioned, looks forward to the healing of creation. Elisha says, thus saith the Lord. He makes it clear that God had done the healing, and that healing continued. Uh, when the account of Second Kings was written, the waters of that area are still clean, and your God's word endures. Whether it's the healing of waters or the healing of people. In Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul tells us that uh, he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. We as Christians need to reflect the working of Christ in our lives. And I want to return to that quote by Spurgeon. We must not fight God's battles with the weapons of ill will. For us to hate those who are in error and talk of them with contempt or wish them ill or do them wrong, is not according to the spirit of Christ. Jericho here was not a place that was friendly to God. It had abandoned God. It was built in defiance of God. And yet God would send his servant to heal their waters. We cannot, as Spurgeon goes on to say in that quote, cast out Satan by Satan, nor correct error by violence, nor overcome hate by hate. A conquering weapon of the Christian is love. And so as we look at this miracle of healing and restoration, it's again a picture of grace, 
of God doing something for the undeserving. All right, so as we continue to review our Sunday services um, from the 23rd of August, which I know is uh, quite a while back now, it feels like um, we're going to look at Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. And here is one of the accounts we have in the Gospels of the Transfiguration. The account is in Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. And I would encourage you to uh, just take a moment to read that as we uh, work through it verse by verse. Now, here's my one sentence summary of the message. The transfiguration account is a demonstration of the power, purity and change which Jesus brings. In uh, Warren Wiersbe's commentary, he says, you and I can share the image of Jesus Christ and go from glory to glory through the ministry of the Spirit of God. Uh, Paul speaks of this going from glory to glory in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And what I want us to see as we go through this is I want us to be encouraged to meditate on the glory of Jesus, to understand it as the Holy Spirit reveals it through the word. And as a, refer, as a result of that, have it reflect in our own lives. So, first of all, there is the promise of glory. Jesus here promised them that they would see his glory. He said that there would be some of them in verse one that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all the things that this doesn't mean. What Jesus was speaking about here was clearly telling some of them they would see the transfiguration. When you look at the possibilities of the word kingdom, you look at the possibilities of the word power and, and its variations. Um, what has to be in sight here is the transfiguration. Uh, and so the witnesses, Peter, James and John, were going to see the glory. You know, you look at the context, you look at the words, the transfiguration is what Jesus is telling them here was going to happen. It fits the context of all three gospel accounts and the interpretation works. They saw in the transfiguration in miniature the kingdom of God come with power. They got to see a glimpse of what all believers will see in the millennial kingdom and what all creation will see in the second coming when Christ comes to establish his kingdom. Uh, Jesus shows his disciples that his soon arrest, suffering and death could only happen because he allowed it. They're going to see his power displayed. And later on, they'll be able to reflect on the fact that one who could have this glory radiate from within him has to have power, has to have almighty power. So uh, there is a glory that is promised. There are promises of glory to Christians were promised of a glory to come, of glorified bodies, of an inheritance uh, being joined as with Christ. Jesus tells us that the laborer is worthy of his hire, and Jesus is going to reward us, his servants. And so that's something for which we can look uh, forward to. So there's a promise of glory, and then there is a pattern of glory. You know, the, the result of being changed into the image of Christ is, of course, Christ likeness. In verse 2, it says, after six days, Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John and leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured by them. Some believe this was Sinai or Tabor. Most likely, this was Mount Hermon. Um, you know, there is an interesting connection with Psalm 133. It talks about the anointing oil and the dew of Hermon. And, you know, what better place to show Jesus Christ as our great high priest and as uh, the, the Son of God. Uh, so Hermon. Again, you look at the surrounding context, which seem to be, seem to be the uh, location in mind here. And Jesus was transfigured. Uh, one commentator says that maybe the true transfiguration happened in Bethlehem many years before when Jesus was changed from his eternal glory to take on the form of a servant. And here again, there is a transfiguration. Jesus is revealing his true glory, which has just been shielded for a time. And he wasn't covered with light, but he was changed, glorified in some way. Uh, it was a metamorphosis. It's where we get our word from the Greek for metamorphosis. There was no light that shone on Jesus. This was his own glory radiating from within. And so in a sense, it wasn't so much that uh, he was changed, but that his glory was revealed. You know, surrounded by snow, as Mount Hermon often is, suddenly without warning, Jesus' clothing here began to shine brighter than the snow. This word for transfiguration is also found in 2 Corinthians 3.18 and Romans 12.2. You 
in Romans 12 too, it's translated as transformed. And again, it's got the idea there of us being transformed and being changed into the image of Jesus Christ, being changed to what God wants us to be. So Christ likeness is revealed is the result of spending time with him in the word and prayer. And Christ likeness, though, is, re- is received. You know, Jesus remained physically recognizable, but his clothes shone brighter than the snow around them. And, you know, one day we are going to share in that. Uh, you know, the, the fuller's work that it describes there usually involves pounding or trampling the garments in water and then adding uh, chemicals, some kind of alkaline chemical. Uh, then the garments were rubbed with chalk or the earth and it produced a really bad smell. Uh, and even with all of that process, nothing compared to the white of the radiance of Jesus Christ. His dazzling robes here was reflecting more than anything that any human could do. It reflected his pureness within. You know, when we look at not just the appearance here, but the true righteousness of Christ, none of us can develop that within ourselves. We receive salvation as a free gift by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And you know, Christ likeness is remembered. It says there appeared unto them Elias with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. You know, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. Moses had died and God buried him on Mount Nebo. Moses represents then the resurrected saints of the rapture. Elijah was caught up alive into heaven. And so Elijah represents raptured saints caught up alive. You know, there's much symbolism that's here. They have a conversation. They talk about Jesus' suffering that is to come and his decease and resurrection. And you can get that from Luke chapter 9, verse 31. And you can be sure that those three disciples remembered this event. Now, finally, there's not only the promise of glory uh, and the pattern of glory, but there is the power of glory, the power to change. Peter here is uh, his his good old self. Um, Peter answered and said to Jesus, well, you know, there could be a grammatical thing going on here. I understand that. But, you know, in another sense, Peter often answered questions that nobody had asked. He just impetuously spoke out. Nobody asked a question, but he answered it. He talked there about building tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elias. And we want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, uh, when you look at the later phrase here in verse five, it says he wished not what to say, for they were sore afraid. He didn't know what to say, but he spoke anyway. How often can we be that way? You know, if you don't know what to say, usually the best course of action is to say nothing. You know, it says that they were afraid. And one of the old concordances defines this word as being frightened out of one's wits. It's only used one other time in Hebrews 12, 21. And I'll leave you to look that up. So there is the power to change. The apostles were changed by what they saw. But there is the power to challenge. You know, Peter says, you know, let's make a tabernacle for all three of you. But God the Father is going to speak from heaven and say, no, you you listen to one. This is all about Jesus. A cloud overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no man anymore save Jesus with themselves. You know, Peter rushes the blood out and error and he's interrupted by the father from heaven. And the father's voice tells them, listen to my son. What an admonition for us to listen to Jesus Christ only. They were challenged by the Father, challenged by the Son. When they came down from the mountain, Jesus told them to tell no one until the Son of Man was risen from the dead. You know, this was a high point in Jesus' ministry. And yet uh, Peter and the others are told, don't tell anyone what you have seen. As they descend down from Mount Hermon, the path is leading almost directly to the cross. The, The days are limited before Jesus is going to be crucified. You know, for us as Christians, as we see Jesus, we see his glory. According to 2 Corinthians uh, 3.18, we are changed from glory to glory. Uh, And, you know, that is going to have an impact upon the way that we live. But if we're going to be changed, we need to spend time with our Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope this has been a blessing and a help to you. And God willing, we'll catch up with some of our other services very soon. God bless you.